This is CBC Here and Now. This morning I received more complaints. Effective today, Minister Kirby will be removed from Cabinet and will be removed from the caucus of the Liberal Party. This is bullying and intimidation at its finest. I am sick and tired of this. This has to stop. It's enough. The people of the province are fed up. I, as an elected MHA, am fed up. It's time to really change the culture in how we do the work of the people. A second Liberal cabinet minister stripped of his post and booted from caucus. And more accusations of a toxic workplace. Dwight Ball made the announcement before the legislature reopened for the week. Education Minister Dale Kirby is out of the cabinet and out of the party. Here and now's Megan McCabe is live in our newsroom tonight. Megan, I was with you another incredible day at the House of Assembly. Walk us through what happened. Well, just before the session started this afternoon, Premier Dwight Ball told reporters that Liberal MHAs had filed complaints against Education Minister Dale Kirby. Ball says that Kirby is relieved of his ministerial duties and out of the caucus while those complaints about his behavior are under review. So soon, there will be three desks here in the independent section of the House of Assembly. Former Municipal Affairs Minister Eddie Joyce had his desk moved behind Paul Lane's earlier today. Joyce was kicked out of caucus last week as the Commissioner of Legislative Standards investigates complaints from two MHAs about his behavior. And now Dale Kirby's desk will be added. Last week, after then-PC leader Paul Davis raised questions about bullying in the House, Dale Kirby sent this email asking if any Liberals planted those harassment allegations with the opposition. And here's what Kirby said about it. There are also people saying that your email was an act of bullying. What do you think about that? I don't believe that's the case. Well, Megan, we know that email did ruffle feathers last week, but do we know if it led to the complaint against Kirby? We do not. Uh, Ball says that he can't get into the specifics of these complaints. Um, all he said was that the complaints are not physical or sexual in nature, as the complaints against Eddie Joyce are not physical or sexual in nature. And there will be two separate investigations. Yes, it will. It will be two separate complaint uh, processes. The way it works is once individuals would come forward, uh, last week we saw it with uh, Minister Joyce at the time, this week now it's about Minister Kirby, so the, these will be separate review processes. It's not clear how long Joyce or Kirby will be out of caucus while these complaints are under review, and neither were at the House today, by the way. In the meantime, uh, Advanced Education Skills and Labor Minister Al Hawkins is taking over education from Kirby, and Justice Minister Andrew Parsons is looking after municipal affairs and environment from Eddie Joyce. Anthony? All right, that's Megan McCabe live in our newsroom. Now, a third Liberal MHA is under scrutiny. The town of Port Blandford is upset with Terra Nova MHA Colin Holloway. The town says he left inaccurate and misleading comments on the town's Facebook page. Today, Paul Davis claimed the Commissioner of Legislative Standards is investigating Holloway, but in fact, that is not the case. Holloway didn't appreciate the false allegation, and he had some pretty strong words for Paul Davis. Stand in that house. And they're talking about bullying and intimidation. And this is bullying and intimidation at its finest. And I'm calling on the new leader of the PC party to remove Mr. Davis from his caucus because this cannot be tolerated. I am sick and tired of this. This has to stop. My reputation has been tarnished today. You know, for somebody who works extremely hard, that, that's hard to swallow. This is very hard on me. It's hard on my family. It's unacceptable. Holloway asked the new PC leader to kick Paul Davis out of the PC caucus. That new PC leader is Chess Crosby. Crosby isn't going to remove Davis from the party. However, he is going to try to rebuild the PC party. Crosby won the leadership on Saturday, beating Tony Wakeham. Crosby is the son of longtime federal MP John Crosby. Outgoing leader Paul Davis used his final speech as leader to take aim at the gover governing liberals. He urged the party to become an alternative for voters, which Crosby said is a priority for him. 
Since 2001, all the leaders of the PC party have served as premier, a habit I hope will continue next year. <laughs> This afternoon, Crosby made his first appearance at the House of Assembly, sitting in the gallery because he doesn't have a seat. Before that, he appeared on CBC Radio St. John's Morning Show, saying his goal is to rebuild the party, which now has only seven seats in the legislature, and he says he's going to look to the public to get opinions about the problems the province is dealing with, including spending and Muskrat Falls. That he'll also weigh in on the harassment complaints coming out of the House of Assembly. The legislature has become a toxic workplace. So I say that that's part of our democratic deficit. It's the place where our laws are made. It needs to operate uh, at, at top efficiency and effectiveness. And bullying, harassment, those things are not calculated to make it function well. We desperately need to address many things about democracy here and we should start with that since it's top of mind right now. And later on Here and Now, I sit down with the new PC leader and I'll ask him about his plans to get a seat in the House of Assembly. I'm meteorologist Colette Kennedy in for Ryan Stodden this evening. And you know, we are looking at temperatures maybe a little bit above where they should be for this time of year, but also heading into a week with an unsettled pattern. I'll break it all down for you coming up. Police have identified the victim of last week's homicide in Labrador City. 28-year-old Vincent Belanger Dompierre from Montreal was found dead in a home on Pine Avenue early Thursday morning. Police arrested 30-year-old Vince Ward and charged him with first-degree murder. The RNC say it's not clear how long Dompierre had been in Labrador City. Homicide investigators want to speak to anyone who had contact with him in recent weeks. Dompierre was 6 feet 6 inches tall and 300 pounds, and police say he may have stood out on account of his size. Well, the town of Springdale has made a decision about a controversy facing the town. The town council has decided not to paint a rainbow crosswalk in their community. The town released a statement today, one week after Springdale High School students met with councillors to try to change their mind. Here are now's Garrett Barry reports. This is the press release that the town of Springdale sent this afternoon. In this statement, Mayor Dave Edison apologized for what he called poor communication of his town's original decision. But he's also sticking to that decision, saying the town council does not want the precedent that a rainbow crosswalk would create. That's the same reason town council gave earlier this month after council first voted to deny the request. Students from the Gender Sexuality Alliance proposed a rainbow-colored crosswalk between Indian River High School and the town's arena as a show of support for LGBT rights. Edison says our decision was not a criticism of the LGBTQ plus community, nor was it intended to show in any way that we don't support them. We do support them. The town Council now says it will consider other ways to show support. Suggestions include a rainbow picnic table or a pride flag at Town Hall. One advocate says that's a piece of good news. I can't lie and say that I'm not disappointed. I definitely uh, wish that we had gotten a rainbow crosswalk. Um, however, um, if we're going to find some positivity in all of this, uh, the town does seem to want to um, do some other work towards inclusion. Dave Edison is not doing interviews today, but in this statement, he says town council could have done a better job explaining itself. He says he's committed to building a relationship with the Gender Sexuality Alliance and supporting their work in Springdale. Garrett Barry, CBC News, Gander. The man accused of killing Victoria Head will not be appearing in court anytime soon. Stephen Bragg's preliminary hearing is set to start tomorrow, but a judge has ruled Bragg will not have to be present for that. We can't give you the reasons why those are protected under a publication ban. Victoria Head was a 36-year-old mother whose life came to an end last year. A hiker found her body off a dirt road in St. John's on Remembrance Day. Following her death, police issued a warning to sex workers and people living in the downtown to be extra vigilant. Bragg was charged with first-degree murder in February. Head's family says they are confident justice will be served. 
The driver of this Corvette has chosen to be tried in Supreme Court in St. John's by judge and jury. Brandon Quilty was not in court today when his lawyer made that selection. Quilty is charged with dangerous driving causing death. The accident happened on Blackhead Road heading towards Shea Heights last May. 27-year-old Justin Murrins died in hospital after that crash. Murrins was a passenger in the Corvette. Today, Quilty also had a preliminary hearing set for the end of July. The city of St. John's pleaded guilty today for its role in a fatal accident on the Outer Ring Road seven years ago. This SUV slammed into three men, killing one of them and injuring the other two. The city was charged under the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Men working with the city, the province and Irving Oil were on the highway inspecting asphalt. St. John's had pleaded not guilty but lost at trial in 2014. It appealed and a new trial was ordered, but today the city changed its plea to guilty. It was ordered to pay about $60,000. The lawyer for the city told the court the money has already been paid. Well, on your birthday, it's kind of normal for people to give you presents, but today Metrobus is actually giving away free rides in celebrations of its uh, 60th birthday or anniversary. So how do people in St. John's feel about taking the bus? Here now, Zach Gowdy joins us live with that story. Zach, you took a free ride and chatted with people along the way today. What are they saying? Oh, of course, the bus is a great place to meet people and uh, have lots of chats. And today I met so many who said they love Metrobus and it's a really important part of their lives. In fact, the comment I heard most often from people was, it's the only way I get around. And I, I think that touches on something important, actually, because the people who really use Metrobus tend to like it very much. The big question is, how do you get people who never consider taking public transportation to give Metrobus a try? Maybe it's the nice weather, or maybe it's the free bus rides. But at this busy stop, people had only good things to say about Metrobus. Oh, I find it excellent. The, uh, the drivers are so friendly. You know, when you're getting on and off the bus and stuff like that, I think they're great. And it's a lot easier getting around than, than having to park the car in the parking lot. Like back home, we don't live for like five days because I'm from the Bahamas. But yeah, we have it for seven days, so the time is good. After 60 years on the road, Metrobus has built a service that compares well to other mid-sized Canadian cities. Total ridership is right on average, cost of a ticket is cheaper than average. But rides per capita is below average, and Metrobus's costs are significantly higher. Still, people with first-hand experience of other cities say we should appreciate what we have. When I first came here, I was really surprised by the, the accuracy of the, accurate of the time. Uh, yeah, we are not used to it because back in home there was no transportations like this. There was just like your car or your taxi or whatever, but uh, there was no buses like this or transportation. Some loyal riders say the system's biggest problem isn't the buses, it's where you wait for them. Bus shelters, more bus shelters for the older people or people because of the bad weather and stuff like that. I find it's hard, you know, especially if it's raining or if it's snowing or cold or so, stuff like that. St. John's City Councilor Ian Froud takes the bus every day, including two council meetings. He says the city is targeting younger riders and trying to build bus riding habits. I think you look at grade nine students who are beginning to gain independence uh, in their life and want to get around the city. Transit's a great option for them. But whether you're young or old, new to St. John's, or have lived here for years, the city wants you to get on board with public transportation. Just try it out this week. Take, take a trip to, uh, to work or uh, an appointment or wherever you're going to just give it a try. 60 years of transit in the city is, is something to, to celebrate. Um, having an option, there's three, about three million rides that, that happen on Metrobus in the run of a year, and that's people getting to work, uh, to play, and to community events. Uh, and that plays an essential role in lots of people's lives. And hey, the birthday isn't over, so if you have somewhere to be tonight, why not jump online, look up a route, and give Metrobus a try? It's still free, so there's really nothing to lose. Reporting live in St. John's, I'm Zach Gowdy for Here and Now.
Well, a familiar face, that's former CBC reporter, now Lieutenant Governor Judy Foote boarding the bus. As Zach said, today marks the Metro bus's 60th birthday. In honor of the big day, we dipped into the CBC archives to see how it's changed over the years. <laughs> Those old buses. <laughs> a bit of history for you. Metro bus got its name in the early 70s, but the transit system actually began more than a decade before that in 1958. And in fact, for you real history buffs, Transit actually dates back to the 1860s in St. John's, back when S.G. Archibald operated a horse-drawn bus service. CBCNL has been honored with a number of journalism awards over the last few weeks. Our team was thrilled to take home four Atlantic Journalism Awards, two RTDNA Awards, and a Gracie Allen Award. CBCNL has been recognized for strength in long-form storytelling, investigative journalism, and issues that we tackle in the public interest. Thank you for your support. Yeah, and among those uh, recent, Here and Now was named uh, Best Television Newscast this past weekend in Halifax at the Atlantic Journalism Awards. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it was for a show we did on October 30th, 2017. Uh, you were just... And your second week second here week? as right, well, co-host? I peaked too soon. I'm out of here. Still on. Good luck. <laughs> and you have something else to say. Yes. I know you want to add. Well, you know, the transition from radio to television, and sometimes you sort of watch a show and you don't really appreciate the number of people that go in as reporters, camera people, editors, producers, technical staff, and some great people in our control room. And there's the leadership at the station, uh, assignment and executive producers. So it really is a big team. And uh, not only great for all, all our colleagues, but of course for you for, uh, for tuning in every night. Absolutely. And you for showing up with me <laughs> and putting up with me. Thank you everyone. Alors, nous sommes ici pour euh, une raison simple. The president of Saint-Pierre wants this province to step up and fix this end of its ferry problem. That's next.
The president of St. Pierre and Miquelon is calling on Newfoundland and Labrador to get its act together. The French territory off Newfoundland's south coast has spent tens of millions of dollars on two brand new ferries, but there's a problem on the Newfoundland end of the run. Here now is Mark Quinn has prepared this report. Alors, nous sommes ici pour euh, une raison simple. St. Pierre and Miquelon president Stéphane Lenormand traveled to Newfoundland last week. He met with officials here in person. He says the French territory has spent more than $50 million on two new ferries and the infrastructure required to operate them. It's a big improvement over the old ferry that only carried passengers. The two new 55-meter-long vessels can carry up to 15 cars and three transport trucks. But there is a hitch. The Newfoundland end of the run in Fortune isn't equipped to offload trucks and cars. Upgrading it to do that is estimated to cost $3.5 million. The Fortune Port Corporation says it has $2 million from the province and ECOA. That leaves it $1.5 million short. The president of St. Pierre and Miquelon was here last week to encourage the province and Canada to find the remaining money for the upgrades. Alors, les ferries vont commencer uh, après le, le 15 mai uh, avec les passagers. The new ferries are expected to start operating for passengers only after May 15th. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Back to tonight's top story. Two of Dwight Ball's cabinet ministers are out of cabinet and out of caucus. Eddie Joyce last week. Today, it's Education Minister Dale Kirby. Both are under investigation by the Commissioner of Legislative Standards following complaints of harassment. Before today's sitting, Anthony grilled the Premier about keeping his house in order. Uh, last Wednesday, I stood in front of you and talked about, said that I had received a, a complaint uh, against a MHA, which turned out to be a minister. We took some very prompt action back last week in uh, dealing with the issue at Anne, uh, put in place a review process using the Commissioner of Legislative Standards. We uh, removed the minister from both cabinet and from our caucus. Uh, so this morning, the allegations were made against uh, a minister, so effective today, Minister Kirby will be removed from cabinet and will be removed from the caucus of the Liberal Party. Uh, he's been aware of this, and the acting minister will be uh, Al Hawkins, who will take on the role of education and early childhood development. As you know, uh, I've said in the past, I've encouraged people to come forward, and we will take decisive action. I can assure you, as leader of this party, we will do so in the most uh, open and transparent way, making sure that we make sure that we put in place a workplace that is free from harassment and is safe. I will also say that this morning's allegations are not sexual or physical of nature. It really go comes down to behavior and conduct. To your knowledge, has the MHA, and I don't expect you to name this person, have they contacted the RNC with respect to this matter? You know, what they would have done, you know, on issues, that's not something that, uh, you know, I would be aware of. What I am aware of are uh, things that would have been disclosed to me this morning that I now will be referring to the Commissioner of Legislative Standards. Does ousting I Mr. Kirby help you try to reestablish some control over caucus? This is not about control over caucus. This is about keeping the integrity of a government that I lead, and I will continue to lead in a very open and transparent way, making sure, making sure that we respect the rights of people to work in a, in a workplace that is free from harassment. Once allegations are made, we've made decisions promptly, as I did last week, and I'll continue to do so. How do you reduce the chaos? This is how you, you make decisions, and this is exactly what we're doing, and I will not stop until we get to the point that we have improved, if indeed it, it uh, recommends improvements, into the House of Assembly. It's important. That's what leaders do, and leaders make decisions, and I'm prepared to lead this province through and to lead this House of Assembly through these times. 
Do you find any irony in the fact that the Minister of Education up until today has basically been a bully and you're expelling him? Well, the, you know, the review process will, will take its course and we will see what the recommendations would come out of this. Uh, so that, that is as much as I will say about this at this time. I think that is a fair statement to make. Let the review process unfold and let's get through this in a very thorough, thoughtful way so that uh, when the recommendations come forward, when the review is complete, you know, I would like to see these reviews made publicly, uh, made public, but of course we have to respect the views of all individuals that are involved. So Debbie, two ministers are gone in less than a week. It's very rare in politics that that happens, mm -hmm. and you can see the Premier actually trying to do what he thinks is right, but it, you get the feeling that having been up there today and last week, it's just, there's a feeling that it's chaotic. You know, there's mm. a lot of chaos. And, and uh, it's not over, it appears. I think the story, as we say in this business, still has legs. Yeah. Well, it's officially rowing season. The shells are in the water in Kitivity Lake for the very first time. I'll tell you about the lead up to the 200th Royal St. John's Regatta coming up on Here and Now. This weather update is brought to you by the HCF Home Lottery. Bonus deadline is Friday at midnight. Get your tickets now at hcfhomelottery.ca. Welcome back, everyone. 
What a fabulous weekend. Big temperature drop here, yep. though, on the yep. Avalon. Put the shorts and t-shirts <laughs> away for today. So let's uh, take a look at the forecast and what it has in store. Here's Colette Kennedy at the CBC Weather Center. Thank you, Debbie and Anthony. Yeah, first of all, just having a look at what we're seeing with the temperatures across both Newfoundland and Labrador. And really, we're finding that the readings continue to be a little bit above seasonal. And St. John's and average height this time of year would be 8. So... 12 degrees, and these are the unofficial highs, by the way, not too bad. And in fact, some mild temperatures, Happy Valley, Goose Bay. How about some double digits there? Corner Brook, certainly into the double digits, around 14 degrees. So there's some mild air in there. We've been kind of dealing with a pattern where we get a trough of low pressure going through, then a little bit of high pressure being squeezed in between, and then, of course, the next system moves in, and we're kind of on that doorstep. So what we're going to be seeing, certainly cloud cover today, the winds gusty from the northwest. They're actually going to be turning more towards the southeast, and that's going to bode well for us to some extent. However, what we will find is that we're going to see a little bit of that drizzle developing, a little more fog for the Avalon coming in through the overnight hours as well. Elsewhere, you can kind of see that ridge of high pressure just being pushed out by this broad trough coming in. Some colder air aloft as well behind it. That makes things unsettled and kind of a slow pattern to change as well. So what I mean by that, it's not going to be raining constantly, but it's the situation where we get into drizzle, light showers, then you get a break, but the clouds kind of hang in there. And that pattern I kind of see setting up for much of this week, most of it, in fact, ahead. Just having a quick look at future trackers so we can take this forward and show you how things are looking. As I was saying, those winds shifting around to the southeast, certainly for the Avalon. We'll be seeing that as well for you folks here at Port of Basque, where you're going to find the winds just a little bit breezier there towards southwestern parts of the island. And up into Labrador, we're talking about those wind speeds a little bit stronger along the coast, of course, as you might expect, but also looking at the temperatures coming down a little bit from where they had been through today as some of that cooler air moves in. And certainly, Nain, you've been on that borderline. You're going to continue to see the colder air pushing through there. You can see the rain moving up, coming through the area into the day tomorrow. Some heavier rain possible here back towards the southwest, again, where you might actually get periods of significant rainfall. But otherwise, in many cases, Corner Brook, Grand Falls, Windsor, we're talking about more of a pattern of light showers to a bit of drizzle rolling through, too. A look then at your forecast for tonight, Nain. A little bit of flurry activity possible there as the temperature drops down to the freezing mark and those northwesterly winds there. But you see that northeasterly to southeasterly flow and some drizzle for St. John's, 2 degrees. Drizzle as well, Port of Basque, over towards Marystown. And you're looking at the overnight low for Grand Falls, Windsor right there around five degrees. We're going to add 10 to that into tomorrow, though. One of the warmest spots we'll see. You'll get some breaks, but yes, some rain in there, too. And we're going to see that drizzle come to that pattern for us along the west coast and up the northern peninsula. We may see a little bit more sunshine there. And so the temperature for St. Anthony, eight with some of that sun up towards Cartwright, double digits, 10 degrees there. And for Happy Valley, Goose Bay, actually seeing the temperature going up to 13 degrees for the high tomorrow. So there's still that pocket of some warmer air where that ridge of high pressure is, but otherwise the unsettled weather coming in. And I'll talk about how long it is going to last through this week when I come back. Thank you, Colette. That's Colette Kennedy at the CBC Weather Center in Toronto. Well, this is a big year for the Real St. John's Regatta. You saw earlier on the show, Metrobus turning 60. Well, the Regatta is turning 200. This morning, the 200th rowing season got underway. Here now as Peter Cowan explains. Today was the very first day that rowers have actually had a chance to get out on the water at Kitty Lake and start preparing for the 200th regatta. It was actually the regatta committee that was the very first boat to go out for a little spin around the lake as they marked the official start of the season. And a lot of teams are anticipating this year. The 200th has brought out people who maybe competed in the past and want to do it again. And new people who've decided to get involved in the sport and figure the 200th was the time to do it. 200 is a long time. And here's why the committee chair thinks this event has lasted so long. The St. John's Regatta and the city itself has sort of grown together and, and evolved to, to what it is today. So I think it's more of a celebration of the city and the province and the sort of our heritage. And I think if you look at it that way, um, it, it's a big event. <laughs> For some of the competitors, it's about winning the gold rings that are going to be given out to the male and female winning teams this year. 
but for some it's about the opportunity to get out and have a team building exercise. I think this is a special sport. You can't do it by yourself. There's, you know, six other people involved, which include your coxswain. So I, I love a team sport where, you know, it's not just one person. You actually need the seven of you. As well as the races, the committee does have other extra things planned for around the lake for this 200th year. For example, there's going to be a big concert, and there's also a plan to have a march from one of the parks down here to Lakeside. Peter Cowan, CBC News, St. John's. Today is the last day to get studded tires off your vehicle. The Highway Traffic Act permits studded tires to be used between November 1st and April 30th. However, the minister does have the power to extend that deadline. But with many areas of the province experiencing warmer than normal temperatures, that hasn't happened. Well, starting today, the government will be emailing you reminders to renew your driver's license and vehicle registration. It will no longer send reminders by Canada Post. The idea is to reduce costs without reducing frontline services, and it's supposed to help reduce waste as well. The inaugural season of the St. John's Edge has come to an end. The team lost Game 6 of the Central Division Finals to the London Lightning last night at Budweiser Gardens. It was a tight battle. The final score, 106 to 101. League MVP Carl English finished with 21 points and 11 rebounds. Well, they, they lost. It was a close game, but what an inaugural season for this uh, team. I mean, the city, the province has, has basically put their arms around a them. A lot of people would have bet against it being so yeah. successful in St. John's. Yeah. And people came from far and wide and like four and 5,000 yeah. people. And they lost over the Fantastic. weekend to a great team. No shame in that. So next season, it's always <laughs> next year. People tell me I'm a good listener. <clears throat> you may not think that's, you know, great skill than anybody, but it's actually fairly rare. A familiar name in politics will lead the PC party in next year's provincial election. Next, what Chess Crosby's priorities are. Well, it's a new era for the Provincial Progressive Conservatives. Chess Crosby takes the reins of the party after defeating Tony Wakeham for the leadership over the weekend. Where there is 
unity, there is always victory. Our party and our province face a crossroads of confidence. The general election next year will be our most significant election since Confederation. The Confederation vote in 1948 was a vote of confidence in our future as a proudly independent, sovereign province of Canada. But now, under the failing liberal government, our financial path is unsustainable and confidence has collapsed. The general election of 2019 is a crossroads for confidence in the future and a crossroads of confidence for the next generation. Well, I'm obviously disappointed that I didn't win, but I'm very happy for the party. I think you've uh, seen a united party coming out of this convention and that with a direction that we are ready to take on the Liberals and take back government. Do you intend to run in 2019? Absolutely. That's the intent right now. I haven't made up my mind uh, yet where to, but certainly I will run and represent the PC party. And Chess Crosby is the son of John Crosby, a veteran politician from this province who cut a wide swath provincially and federally. But this is Chess Crosby's first political win. Congratulations, Mr. Crosby. Thank you very much. Uh, as uh, somebody once said, perseverance is the hard work you do after you finish doing the hard work you've already done. <laughs> I know you were chasing this prize for a year and a half, but I'm just wondering in your quiet moments, since you won on Saturday night, do you ever feel like that uh, dog who caught the proverbial car? <laughs> you heard my joke when I came into the studio. Uh, yeah, so, you know, lots of challenges to get up to speed on things with the caucus. I also had uh, coffee with Tony Wakem, my opponent this morning before he left town to go back home. I uh, had a meeting with Mr. Davis, uh, putting lots of things in place, and I'm learning about how the House operates, and it's been operating at high speed today. Well, that's an understatement. Uh, speaking of that, you were there. You watched everything. You cannot go and sit on uh, the, the floor of the House of Assembly because you don't have a seat. How big an obstacle is that? Um, it's desirable to be in the house. Mind you, being outside the house gives you a chance to see things from 30 or 40,000 feet as well. So, um, you know, I'm not in the boiling pot, as it were, and I can keep a certain objectivity about it. And it's clear to me that our House of Assembly is in a uh, part of the democratic deficit, the respectful workplace issues that have been brought out, particularly in the last week are systemic in extent and need to be addressed. Mm. You said you, you're looking at this from, you know, without uh, an obstructed view, uh, but it, that I'm sure can only last so long. I'm thinking of the former NDP leader, Earl McCurdy. He looked hamstrung politically by not having a seat. So how much of a priority is this going to be for you as in the very short term? Um, I've said before I'd prefer to run in a St. John's area seat and uh, when uh, opening, if an opening does happen in a seat that's uh, on the other side of the island, for example, uh, there are always candidates with deep roots in a district, uh, you know, like that. Uh, and you've got the way, uh, who's got the best chance of winning that district? So it's not as simple, you know, it's not necessarily a simple proposition. If the St. John's area seat opened up, I'd certainly be very interested. Would you be leaning on any of the caucus to step, step aside for you? And what about Paul Davis's seat? He's not going to be around longer. Well, I had a conversation with Mr. Davis this morning, and uh, he's got no particular plans to either stay or go. I think, you know, he'll, he's going to be um, stepping back and giving me space to leave my stamp on things. and. And that's fine, and I appreciate that from Mr. Davis, but he enjoys his job. He loves representing people. He loves being in politics. So, uh, you know, I made it known to him. I hope he stays. Uh, you talked briefly, you mentioned what's happened in the last week in the House of Assembly. You've had two cabinet ministers turfed, out of cabinet, out of caucus. And things just keep evolving. You must feel like you'd love to be in that fight, wouldn't you? Not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, you know, it, it's, it's not a pretty sight, frankly, so there's not much to admire about what's happening right now. What you can admire is this bullying and harassment systemic issue, sexism is part of it as well, is finally being exposed to the light of day, so the House is functioning to that extent, but it's an institution of our political democracy that needs to clean its act up. It must be a political gift, though, to uh, the conservatives to see the liberal government in crisis like this? Um, you, you know, it, like I said, it's not pretty, it's not enjoyable. Um, the job of the opposition is to oppose, and Mr. Davis and the caucus are doing that job very well right now. Mr. Crosby, we'll have time to talk about uh, a lot of issues as uh, there's the lead up to the next election, which you've said last Saturday night, this starts that campaign. Um, I'm just wondering, Muskrat Falls is going to loom large during that period because of the inquiry. I'm just wondering, uh, because your party sanctioned that project, are you expecting a rough ride? There's other issues like the economy and so on, but on that issue, are you expecting a rough ride? No. Why not? I personally had nothing to do with it. And uh, it's like I've said before, if mistakes were made, then people just have to say, that was then, this is now, I'm getting on with being the opposition and doing my job, which is to oppose the government. What people are more concerned about, I think, is not what happened in the past, but what's going to happen or might happen in the future. And that's where I'm going to focus my attention. Well, there's another big prize looming a year and a half from now. You've already worked a year and a half to get to this point. Uh, it's going to be an interesting 18 months or so ahead. Thank you. I, I guarantee you it will be. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you. Want to just <laughs> check it out? Yes, that's quite a sweat. Pickleball? has nothing to do with the Premier's current situation. It's actually a unique sport and its popularity in St. John's is growing.
It is time now to meet our young athlete of the day, and there she is, Lauren Foley of Bay Roberts, holding the puck after she scored her first goal in her first year of hockey. This year, she took home the silver medal in the Adam House League Championship and also won the award for the most sportsmanlike player. And Lauren also enjoys softball and many, many other sports. Lauren also happens to be turning 11 tomorrow. So happy early birthday to you and congratulations. You are our young athlete of the day. Well, let's uh, head once again to Toronto and the CBC Weather Center. That's where Colette Kennedy is this evening. Thanks, Debbie and Anthony. And, you know, we're having a look not just at the temperatures, some of the highs, again, unofficial uh, for Newfoundland today, but also taking us through Atlantic Canada into the Maritimes. We'll add those in, some of those readings, lots of them in the double digits. Charlottetown at 11, Halifax 11, uh, actually getting a little bit warmer than that, but that's what it's reading at this time of day. And having a look at St. John's at 12, but St. Anthony a little bit cooler there at 4. Uh, we had those winds coming in from more of a northerly direction, but seeing that shift as we're moving through tonight into tomorrow, and we're going to get more into that southeasterly flow. So that ridge of high pressure, it's kind of getting sandwiched through here. It's what brought some milder temperatures for us into parts of Labrador. Actually going to see that again tomorrow, especially through southern areas. But that ridge is getting squeezed away. We've got a very broad upper trough that's moving through. And as it does, that's why we're going to get into some of this patchy fog that I was mentioning earlier in the show. We'll certainly be seeing that. Uh, we're also going to see light showers to drizzle and a pattern that's going to linger even as this trough moves away it's going to take its time for one thing it's also very very broad in the upper atmosphere but even as it moves away as i roll this forward taking you through the day tomorrow there's yet another system behind it. So again, further to the north, then we get into a situation with clearer skies, although cool temperatures for Nain, we're still even looking at some of that flurry activity overnight tonight into tomorrow, but we get into more significant rains as we're coming Tuesday into Wednesday, so actual periods of rain uh, coming along the coastline, and we'll see those winds getting just a little bit gustier as well. So let me just take it forward. There you go, through the day on Wednesday. See what happened there with the snow line with some of that cold air being fed in by that ridge of high pressure. It means we are going to see even that risk of some mixed precipitation coming down the northern peninsula. But again, that's as we're getting towards midweek. Let me just step out of the way so you can get a little bit of a look of what's happening over the next seven days. The trend being, and I know you're seeing it, this unsettled pattern. So whether you're at St. John's or in western Newfoundland or in between, we're looking at a chance of showers. And by no means do I mean that it's raining constantly all the time. But we're talking about a lot of cloud cover. Even if we do get some little sunny breaks, what tends to happen is that just adds to the instability, especially with a colder air pooling aloft. And so because of that, I'm keeping the pretty significant chance of showers through most of the week. You'll also notice as we get towards Thursday, Friday, the temperature coming down. Now, average for this time of year is actually 8 degrees for St. John's. So it just kind of comes back to where it ought to be for this time of year. But we know what that is about averages right it never almost never hits them now into saturday sunday we do see towards the second half of the weekend temperatures starting to slide back up and by next monday hopefully seeing that unsettled pattern moving away and getting that next ridge of high pressure moving in so we can count on some better weather in the meantime it is a week to just be prepared for some wet conditions debbie anthony Thanks, Colette. That's Colette Kennedy at the CBC Weather Center. So now we're going to move on to a growing sport here in St. John's that's got a catchy kind of name, if not a bit peculiar. It's called pickleball. First for me, it's only been played at the field house since October, but it has picked up a passionate following. Here now is Jeremy Eaton. Stop by to learn a little more. That's a difficult question. It's basically, it's a combination of um, badminton, tennis, I would say a bit of squash and ping pong. So it's, uh, it's less strenuous on the body. You use the size of a badminton court, the outside line. When you serve, you serve from outside the court and it has to be an underhand serve below the waist. And the ball is plastic with holes on it, like a wiffle ball. Although it's not really a wiffle ball. And uh, the paddles are nowadays made of composite. It used to be wooden which is about twice the size of a ping pong bat. No strings involved, right? So you won't break a string. It's very, very hard to break a racket. When we started, 
basically it was my wife and myself uh, playing and then then we uh, sort of knew two other people and they got hooked to it and then there's a guy called Don a 74 year old guy and he was playing ping pong and he thought it was interesting and he joined us and then since then he's been addicted well my wife passed away last February and I had very little to do so I was coming to the gym here and uh, walking around and I hate walking for nothing in circles so I saw them playing here one day and I was invited to play and I fell in love with it. Is, do you break a sweat? Do you get a good workout? How is it? You want to just check it out. <laughs> yes, that's quite a sweat. It's like everything else. It depends on how much you want to put into it. Yeah, you, you put a lot into it. I saw you hit the ball. I try to, I try to be competitive. It's a great equalizer. Seriously, it is. Uh, young people, old people, uh, great skill or no skill. Uh, we play doubles. It's a lot of fun and we can win. We can lose, but we can win. <laughs> it's particularly a good workout for an older demographic. You can see that there's constant movement in it. It's load-bearing activity, so it's good for bone density, cardiovascular benefits, plus flexibility and strength and power in the legs, and it involves quite a bit of core uh, with the twisting and turning of the upper body in relation to the lower body. Well, it's become immensely popular in its short lifespan here at the works. Uh, Dr. Leonard Law introduced it back in October, and we quickly developed a following from one students right up to an older demographic gentleman in their 70s. Wednesday nights, we can have anywhere between 18 and 26 people, uh, and our daytime slot's quite not, not quite as popular, but we're still getting turnouts of 8 to 12 people playing on a regular basis. Very recently, uh, we've started up a league on Sunday evenings, and that's quite popular, and we hope to expand on it next season. It's kind of like a giant ping pong game in like a reels court, right? It looks mm -hmm. a fair bit of fun. It looks really accessible too, as yeah, the, like uh, said. one of the uh, speakers there was saying, young, old, uh, you get what you right. put into it, get out yeah. of it what you put into it. Uh, I like it, looks fun. good. Sunday evenings. All right, we'll see you there, <laughs> Debbie. <laughs> Remember, you can reach us anytime with a tip, an idea, or just to say hello. You can email us at hereandnow.nl at cbc.ca or send us a message on Facebook or, of course, Twitter at cbcnl.
Welcome back. And you may want to sit down for these gut-twisting aerobatic uh, performances at a spectacular air show in central China. This plane, under the expert control of a British pilot, mesmerized the crowd by intentionally stalling. Oh my gosh. Yeah, the engine just cut out. Ah, falling like a leaf and then gracefully rejoining the team. And earlier in the weekend, there was another heart in throat moment. A group of <laughs> Italian aviators took to the night sky using smoke and uh, some LED lights in a kind of high flying fireworks display. Wow. Check that out. That'll dazzle you a bit. A total of nine world-class aerobatic teams and over 200 planes took part in this big air show in central China. That is quite something. I've never seen a show at night wow. in the daytime. Oh, pretty, pretty good. A little stomach <laughs> <goes. laughs> Now, you might think that cows uh, in a field aren't all that unusual, but they were enough to bring out quite a crowd in Sweden yesterday. Apparently it's a thing there. More than a thousand people turn up at this farm in Stockholm for the annual cow release when the animals are let out of the barns where they've spent the winter and the cows did not disappoint. As you can see, lots of pent up energy they're released. They're, actually, they're playing. <laughs> Never seen cows play before. <laughs> That's our show. Yep. Thanks so much for being with us. Have a great night and we'll see you back here tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs>